Thanksgiving. Well, part two uh, tonight, Bill's going to give us the good stuff. So, brother, no further ado, have at her. in Rome. Uh, Paul was not intimidated by the intellect of Greece or by the power of Rome. Uh, when, when describing to the, to the Corinthians the typical attitudes towards the gospel, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, but I preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. Paul was not ashamed because he knew from, from experience that, what, uh, that the gospel had the power to transform lives. He was eager to take it so as many as, to as many as he as would listen. You know, that's, that's a lot, right? That, has that changed in, in, in Paul's day versus today's modern Christian, Christian churches? It really hasn't changed, right? It's, we really don't care whether whether people shout us down or whether people want to, you know, say different things about us that, that aren't believers. What we care about is, is just spreading the word, right? Getting that word out there and, and getting more people to understand who Christ is and then let them, you know, let them get that relationship with Christ like we have. You know, we want to celebrate that. We want to share that. So that hasn't changed. It's, it's been a lot of years, but it's still the same, the same principle that we all, we all strive for in that aspect. Uh, the Greek word for power is dynamis. Is dynamis? Kind of like dynamite, yep. Um, okay, dynamis is the source for the words dynamite and dynamic. Dynamite was not invented by Noble until 1867. So that was, that was a couple years after Paul, right? A couple years after Paul, 19, or 1867. So it was obvious that Paul did not have that specific picture in mind, um, you know, when, when they started talking about the, uh, the word for power, the Greek word for power being dynamis. Uh, instead, the inventor of the explosive took the name from the Greek. The gospel can be like a spiritual dynamite. Okay, under, under certain circumstances, 
It has a devastating, even destructive effect, demolishing worlds, worldviews and traditions, uh, pay, paving the way for new construction. Placed inside of a stone-hard heart that is resistant to God, it can shatter the barrier. What, what that means is uh, you could take that, that person, and, and we've all got them in our lives, or we've had them in our lives, and I'm sure many of us still have people like that in our lives that, you know, that they'll sit there and tell you, boy, I'd love to ch- come to your church, but I'm afraid I'd catch on fire as soon as I walked in the door because, you know, of all the things I've done, or I just, you know, that stone hard heart right there, you know, it's, I'm an I'm a avid atheist, and I don't want anything to do with, with your beliefs and your cults and all that other stuff, right? But you know what? The Word of God even in those hard, hard-stoned hearts, can shatter those barriers. Uh, God's power in the gospel is not only explosive, it also overcomes evil. Amen. I haven't shared this with a whole lot of people, but I'll share this one uh, as something that's that experience that I had in my life with this one is uh, three years ago now. Yeah, just over three years ago, boy, or two years ago been a long time, two years ago, uh, my brother-in-law took his life, and we got the phone call, so we went up there to it, and they had uh, gotten him out of the house and all that. Well, his son, my nephew, and I wound up cleaning the, the room where this happened. You know, we had to clean it all up, and I was terrified to go in his room. I sat outside the room for, for quite a while, just getting that motivation, right, that gumption, okay, we got to get there, that's all cleaned up. I knew it was going to be a mess. I was worried about what was going to be in there. You know, I was worried about the, the evil that was in that room. You know, somebody just took their life in there. It wasn't just they, they passed away. It was somebody took their life. It was, it was violent. It was tragic. It was, you know, traumatic. There was a lot of stuff in there. So I was scared to death going in there. So I just, I sat out there and I started, I started worshiping, right? I started singing praise. I started singing worship songs in, in my mind. And, and when I went in there, there was, there was not a feeling of evil. It was peace. It was, it was comfort in there. And it was funny because Shane had preached about that. I, I just literally, but weeks before this happened, and you know, God working the way God does, He knew it was going to happen. He knew that I needed to know that information going into this. So Shane had just preached about this and going in there, and that was the one thing that, at the time, I was like, "Hmm, okay, this this isn't as bad as I thought it was going to be." As far as the the evil that I felt inside, right? So the that evil overcoming evil, and then on our way home, Tab and I were talking about. It, I was like, "Boy, you know, it just." It was peaceful in there. And she said, oh, I felt the same thing. So it's just that whole thing, right? When you start getting into bringing the gospel and bringing, bringing God into the picture, you know, it's, it's explosive. It'll power down evil quicker than, than, than we know how to do. So it's, that's a story. That's a testimony in my life that is, it's true. It's absolutely true. Uh, dynamite must be carefully handled, but it is very effective when put to use in the proper use. Right, we we use dynamite for what? Clearing rocks, for for building roads, for yeah, boy stuff. You know, having fun, right? Right. It's losing fingers. You know, dynamite stuff. Okay, but in the wrong hands, dynamite's a really bad thing, right? In the wrong hands, then we wind up with people getting hurt, right? We wind up with terrorist acts. We wind up with with really bad things happening to good people. Keeping the dynamite under lock and key. Uh, hidden by those who know about it may keep it from being misused, but it also prevents the dynamite from, from doing what it's designed to do, right? If we locked away all the dynamite because we're afraid of people using it, then we're never going to use it for what it's, what it's used for. Dynamite of the gospel deserves that same or that respectful treat, treatment, right? But effectively used, right? It, we, should, we should protect the word. We should protect it like we would dynamite, but we should know when to use the word. We should know when to use it, when not to use it, because that's what that's the word. That's that's what God's going to put in our hearts to to put it out there. You know, we all know there's there's times and there's places. You know, when when we go up to somebody, we start talking to somebody, we start talking about the word of God to them. Sometimes we quick, quickly realize that okay, maybe I'm coming on a little strong right now. Maybe I need to ease into this one a little bit because I'm just going to push them away from me, and they're never going to want to talk to me again. Right, and that's kind of that word of God. Right, we need, we need to know when to use it, when to when to share that word, when to use the word, and what parts of it to use, and and that's you know, boy, just put that up in in God and say, God, talk through me and and say what you need to have said. 
Okay, still, uh, it must never be used as a weapon, but as a constructive power, right? It's one of my worst fears, I guess, that I have in life is, is being that, that stumbling block for, for somebody finding their way to Christ, right? And that's kind of that right there is, is the Word of God can be used. It needs to be used in a, in a constructive way, but not, not to push somebody away from Christ, because that is, to me, that's the worst thing that, at least for me, that's my biggest fear that I could do is, is make somebody not come to church, not get a relationship with Christ because of something that I did or something that I said and become that stumbling block for somebody. So, right, use it. It's got to be constructive, not, not a weapon. Uh, the word dynamic also reminds us of another aspect of the gospel. While bringing spiritual life to a person, we cannot always predict the course that it will take. Paul knew that Christians have the responsibility to proclaim the gospel whenever and wherever they can do it, right? And that's, that's, again, that hasn't changed. That's, that's one of our, our moral values, right, is, as Christians, is to, is to share that word every chance we can, anywhere and everywhere that we get a chance to. Even when they say, you know what, we don't talk about this stuff at work, we sneak it in there. We sneak it in there, right? Absolutely. If they know what I'm talking about, then great. If they don't know, then they don't know, right? Maybe they'll, maybe they'll start to listen a little bit. And that gets into this next section here coming up in a little bit about planting seeds. Um, the only way we receive salvation is to believe in Christ. This offer is open to all people, obviously. Uh, the word is powerful because the power of God resides in it by nature. Right? That's why, that's what the Word is. The Word is, the word is God, right? And it is the Word, uh, God resides in that. The power is not descriptive, or descriptive of how the Word is effective, but a guarantee that it is effective. So the Word's not going to tell us how effective this is. It's, a, it's guaranteed it's going to be effective. You start getting in the Word, it's, it's going to have an effect. Uh, the Word is the inherent power of God that gives salvation to all who accept it. Its power is demonstrated not only by by accomplishing the salvation of a person, but also in its undiminished capacity to do this for everyone who believes. So then what is salvation? It is a forgiveness of sins, but it goes even deeper to a restoration to, to wholeness of all that sin has defaced or destroyed, right? It's, it's not just, um, I mean, it's a, the salvation can only happen when a person believes, right? Believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. Salvation isn't just, you know, it, I shouldn't say just because there's not a just on this, but salvation is more than being a child of Christ, right? Salvation is, is you're, you're wiped away, all, the, all the, the sins of the past, right? When you've when you've confessed with your, with your mouth and you believe in your heart that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and you confess those sins to, to Christ and, and ask for that forgiveness and ask to be a, a child of God and ask to be, to be in his kingdom, then all of that's gone. You know, Shane talks about all the time about the, you know, being, you know, sparking new life, right? And the, the Lamb's book of life being, you know, washed white as snow, right? And that's the blood of God, the blood of Christ, right? That's washes all of that away. That's what salvation's about. Uh, the Jews were given first, were given first innovation because uh, they had been God's special people for more than 2,000 years. Even since God, ever since God chose Abraham, he promised great blessings to his descendants. And that's in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Uh, God did not choose them because they deserved to be chosen but because he wanted to show his love and his mercy to them, teach them, prepare them to welcome his Messiah into the world. He chose them not to play favorites, but so that they would tell the world about his plan of salvation. And boy, did they. Um, being first, then, is simply a statement about the order of God's plan rather than uh, in, in decision of relative values, right? It's, it's not that, the, you know, the, the Jewish 
our, our God's favorites. You know, it's, it's he chose them for a reason, just like he chose every single one of us in this room for a reason. Being first, uh, okay, did that. Uh, Peter, Peter later makes uh, the case in Romans 4 that when God chose Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation, Abraham was still a Gentile. God chose Abraham to bring into being a nation through which he would work to bring salvation to the world. The nation came to, to be the Jews. The entire plan has been an expression of God's love. Right, so that's what God, he used the Jewish nation, Jewish nation there to, for salvation and, and to express God's love. For centuries, Abraham's descendants had been learn, learning about God by obeying his laws, right, in the New Testament, or I'm sorry, the, uh, the Old Testament, uh, keeping his sacrifices his, and feasts and living according to his, to his moral principles. Often they forgot God's promises and requirements and had to be disciplined, but still they had a, uh, a pre- pre- precious, a precious heritage uh, of belief in the one true God. Okay, all the people of the earth, of all the people of the earth, the Jews uh, should have more, or should have been the more ready to welcome the Messiah and to understand his mission and message. And some of them were, and obviously some of them were not. Uh, the disciples and Paul were faithful Jews who recognized in Jesus, Jesus God's most precious gift to the human race. Although Paul was commissioned as the apostle to the Gentiles, even he followed, his, or followed this pattern. Whenever Paul went to the new city, he recognized his obligation to carry the gospel to the first Jew, or to the Jews first. Okay, so that was kind of going through talking about um, you know the power, the power of of the word is the power of God. So the last section here we're going to go into, and then I got a little bit of stuff that I want to go into uh, that I found through some research. Also, last section is the word will never return to me void. Okay, in Isaiah 55, 11, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. God does not go about calling and saving lost sinners. God does not go about calling and saving lost sinners by the, by the unction of the Holy Ghost and by the power of His Word. God's Word is a seed. Just as the rain and the snow are never wasted but accomplished His purposes, so His Word never fails. The Word of God shall stand forever. We never know how God will use even a casual word of witness to plant and water the seed in somebody's heart. So what they're talking about there in Isaiah is it's, they're saying that, you know, how does God, how does God go about calling and saving lost sinners? It's, it's through us. It's through us going out and we're planting seeds, right? We're, we're farmers and it's no different than, than, than Jesus and, and all of the apostles. And, you know, it's no different. It's going out and planting those seeds. It's going out and, and bringing people and, and bringing them to, to understand who God is so that they can make that decision on their own, right? That's something we're not going to do for them. We can definitely show them the way. We can, we can show them who Christ is and, and show them the benefits to, to having Christ in your heart, but they've got to make that decision on their own. Okay, last section here that I really want to go through. Um, this whole, this whole message the last two weeks has been about the Word of God, right? It's been about the Word, gospel. Um, I found this one online. It's nine characteristics of the Word of God. The Word of God is what we love, learn, and live throughout our days. Why? It is not only the book of God to learn about God, 
The Word is God, right? We talked about that last week in, in John. God's Word is like no other. There are so many words that, could, could, that we could select to describe the Word. Amazing, wonderful, magnificent come to mind, but how does the Word describe itself? Here's nine characteristics of the Word of God straight out of Scripture. So the first one is true. Psalms 119, uh, 160. The entirety of the word, of the entirety of your word of your word is truth, and only or and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. John 17, 17. Uh, Sanctify them throughout by your truth. Your word is truth. God's word is truth, and it has always been true. That means it is certain, sure, and faithful. There is nothing false about it. While others may at best be wrong, or at worst, flat out lie, God's word is always true. It is dependable, accurate, trustworthy. Looking for truth, tired of lies, go to the word. Okay, the next one is tried and proven. The word is tried and proven. Uh, 2 Samuel 22, 31. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. It is a shield to all who trust him. Psalms 18, 30. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. Okay, the word of the Lord is proven and tried. Tried means... It has been found good, faithful, and trustworthy throughout experience or testing. Uh, There are so many witnesses from the Old Testament, New Testament, and even right here in the 21st century uh, that we could put on the stand and they could all say the same thing. They tried the word and it works. It is tried, it is tested, and true at all times. So the word is tried and it's proven. Okay, the third one is the word is pure. Proverbs 35, or 30, Proverbs 35, uh, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Psalms 119, 140 Your word is very pure, therefore your servant loves it. Psalms 12, 6. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver, tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. The word of God, every single word he gave is pure. Just like silver, it has gone through the fire to be purified. His word has zero impurities. It is spotless and stainless. There is nothing in it that will harm you. His word is not to be mixed with anything except our faith. And that's in Hebrews 4.2. And we never need to add anything or take anything away from it because it's pure. Right? That's where, you know, this, this church preaches right out of the book. This church preaches, preaches the word, right? Because we don't need to add anything to it. We don't need to take things away from it. We don't need to sugarcoat things in it. You know, we don't need to, to, to change the word of Scripture to meet worldly views of today or, or yesterday, right? We teach what's in the book because the, the book is pure. It's very pure and is never wrong. Okay, the fourth one I have here is right. The word is right. For the word of the Lord is right, and this is in Psalms 33, 4. For the, word of the wor- for the word of the Lord is right, and all his work is done in truth. Somebody is wrong, but the word is true. It's always right. The Hebrew word for right is defined as straight and often translated in Scripture as right, upright, and righteous. That makes sense because if I want to be righteous and in right standing with God, I must obey 
what the Word says, what the Word of God says. If everyone has an opinion and you're not sure who's right, search the Scriptures. The Word is always right. Okay, the fifth one is the Word is perfect. And you'll notice a lot of these that we're hitting were in the, the stuff that we talked about the last two weeks also, right? It's, these are, these are they're, they're perfect, perfect words for describing what the Word is. The Word is perfect, James 1.25. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Psalms 19.7, the, Lord, or the, the law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The word is perfect. It is without blemish, it is without spot. So there's nothing wrong with it. It is entire and complete. So there is nothing it lacks, nothing it needs to be added, there are no errors, no faults, or defects. It is flawless. Accurate and precise. Let's see, accurate and precise. Um, it is his word, and despite those who have tried to, ch- to fight, change, and corrupt it, God has kept it and preserved his word forever. That's a bit about a... I don't have a pass for that one. But it's perfect. Okay, so my sixth one is profitable. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable, profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for institution in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's great right? That's a great thing. Uh, The Word comes from God, so it makes sense that what God gives would be profitable, making us perfect and giving us what we need for every good work. The The Greek word for profitable is defined as helpful, serviceable, and advantageous. The Word of God, when we study it, mediate or meditate on it and apply it certainly yields benefits and gains in this life and obviously in the next. Okay, the seventh one is quick. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word being quick doesn't mean fast. The Greek word is actually a verb that means to live. The word, the word which is God, is alive. It is not dead, stale, dusty, or it is not a, dale, or a dead, stale, dusty book. The word of God is living, working, and operating on us, speaking to us, in real time. That is, why it is, that is why it can heal, save, and accomplish. That is why the Word is always relevant and it's alive. Okay, the eighth one is powerful. The Word is powerful. Hebrews 4.12 For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of soul, spirit, and joints and marrow, Um, and discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word God is powerful. The Greek word in this verse is defined as active and and operative, but it's translated effectual. The word God is powerful enough to have an effect on all of us. This is why Paul wrote in the church of of Thelesius, Thessalonica, that's a tough one. Thessalonica, and said, For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God, which you learn from us, you welcome it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, 
the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. If we accept his word, it's like no, no one else's and then believe it. If we accept his word like no one else's and then believe it, it can actually work on us in ways that will transform our lives for eternity, and that is powerful. Okay, and the ninth and final one is the Word of God is sharp. The Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than two, any two-edged sword. Again, we get into that uh, back into uh, Hebrews 4.12 again. Uh, finally, the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. That word for sharper is a Greek word that, that means to cut, and it is a comprehensive and decisive cut. The Word of God works on us, piercing into the deepest parts of us and dealing within the issues of our hearts and the details of our minds. It cuts out what shouldn't be there, even if we let it get there, and changes us so we're more like Him. Thank God for His words and thank God for working on us. So those are just some other ones that I found, but um, let's see. So that wraps up the, the section there, that, that chapter under for the, for the Word. Shane, did you have anything you wanted to add to it at all? Nope, you did great. Okay. I can't, yeah, don't add to it or take it away. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, well... Lord God, thank you so much, Lord. Thank you for, for this opportunity, Lord, to, to, to dig into to your word, Lord, and to learn more about, you know, the, not just what your word is, Lord, not just what the word says, Lord, but what the word means to us and what it speaks to us, Lord, and, and, and the things that, that that word can do in us, Lord, to us, through us, Lord. We just thank you, Lord. We just thank you so much for that, Lord. We, let, we thank you for for, for providing this for us, Lord, for providing this, this house, Lord, and for this family, Lord, and, and just providing, you know, that this opportunity, Lord, through Christ, Lord, that we get to be part of this family together, Lord, and, and that we get to be your children, Lord, and we just thank you for everything it is that you do for us in, in that, Lord, and we just, we pray, Lord, that, that uh, you work through us, Lord, and continue to work through us, Lord, and help us to grow to, to be those those people out on the street, Lord, that, that can, can share this word, Lord, when the time is right, Lord, that we can share this word with those around us, those people we know, those people we don't know, Lord, those people that we just, we stop and, and they're on the side of the road, and Lord, we walk by and we say hello, Lord, give us the, the, um, the courage, the strength, the, the knowledge and the wisdom to be able to, to strike up that conversation, Lord, and to, to spread that, that seed, Lord, to plant that seed with them, Lord, and just to, to get things out there so that so that that seed can be planted, Lord, and then and you'll continue to um, to give it water, Lord, and give it sunshine, and and to to help it to grow, Lord, and to get them to have that relationship, Lord, and to to help them to see the ways that they need to to see to have that relationship with you, God. So we just thank you. We thank you for everything you do for us, Lord, and just protect us this week, Lord, with the with the weather coming in, Lord, with the rain and the and the storms, Lord, protect those that are out on the roads, Lord, those that are traveling, those that are that are traveling in the woods and on the highways, Lord, and and we just thank you for everything you do. In Jesus' name.